Today, painting by numbers, the DFA Daily to the 22nd of April 2020. Hello again, I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to our latest post covering finance and property news with a distinctively Australian flavour. We continue to get more data to help triangulate what is going on in the real economy. As I discussed on yesterday's live stream discussion, the RBA is expecting a 10% fall in growth in the months ahead, a rise in unemployment and a fall in real prices or deflation. Well, today we got news from the housing Industry Association, who said that new home sales fell sharply in March as consumer confidence declined to be down 23.2% compared to the previous month. Always looking for a positive spin, they said that despite the sharp contraction in sales in the month of March, new home sales for the three months to March remained just 0.9% lower than the same time pre-federal election quarter in 2019. Prior to March, the housing market was gaining momentum and new home sales had been improving. Leading indicators including building approvals, house prices and housing finance data all showed that the market was starting the new decade strongly. The decline in sales in March can be seen across all the states ranging from Western Australia, which experienced the biggest decline of 31.6% to Victoria, which had a 16.9% decline. Across the country, private detached house sales in the March 2020 quarter were lower than in the previous three months in New South Wales, down 1%, and Victoria, down 0.1%. Detached house sales remained slightly higher than in the December 2019 quarter in Western Australia, up 5.8%, Queensland up 3.1% and South Australia up 1.4%. Consumer confidence, overseas migration and population growth are central to the outlook for the residential building industry, they said. Until there is certainty about when the economy will be restarted, including a return of overseas students, it's difficult to forecast the magnitude of a decline in residential building activity. Well, yes. That is indeed the point, that until the virus is under control, the economic recovery is a pipe dream. And frankly, international migration will, I think, be frozen for some long time to come. Elsewhere, rental vacancy rates were down in Sydney during the month of March, according to the latest report from the Real Estate Institute of New South Wales, decreasing 0.4% to 3%. The largest drop was in Sydney's outer ring, where rates decreased from 3.5% to 3%. The inner and middle rings both decreased by 0.3% to 2.5% and 3.6% respectively. The March report is based on survey responses covering 98,000 properties across the state. The residential vacancy rate report is based on the proportion of unlet residential dwellings to the total rent roll of member agents on the 15th of each month. Carried out monthly, the researcher survey of member agents collects the total properties on agency rent rolls, the number of properties that were vacant on the 15th of the month, and the postcode in which a majority of agents' rental properties were located. The suburb level rates reported by agents were weighted based on the ABS Census 2016 dwelling characteristics. The Hunter region also saw a drop in vacancies from 2.1% to 1.3%. Wollongong, the rest of the Illawarra, saw an increase in vacancies from 2.1% to 3.8%. And the other regions of New South Wales reflected a general trend of decreasing vacancies, with only two of the 12 areas, the South Coast and South Eastern, reporting an increase. Of particular note this month is the 11% decrease in survey response rates from property managers when compared to February. This is attributed to the disruption being caused by the virus, a trend that is expected to continue over the next few months as property managers are focusing on the volatile and uncertain rental landscape, they said. We are in uncharted waters 
for the rental market, says the CEO. There is a significant amount of uncertainty about the impact on rental vacancies arising from the fact that many renters are facing job losses or reduced pay. Notwithstanding the six-month moratorium on evictions, this will likely cause more tenancies to be given up, for example, by people moving in with other family members. Also, some short-term accommodation properties are now being listed as available for long-term rentals. These two factors are increasing the supply of rental properties, and I believe we will therefore see a rise in vacancies over the next few months. And interestingly, there are more than 30,000 properties currently available for rent in the area. And the ACCC has granted interim authorization allowing retailers to collectively bargain with landlords about rent relief during the pandemic. The interim authorization granted to the Australian Retail Association and its current and future members will also allow retailers to share information relevant to the negotiations, including in relation to requests by landlords for certain information as part of considering and negotiating support to be provided in the context of the virus. We see a clear public benefit in allowing retailers to work together in the negotiations with landlords as it will help those tenants who are experiencing financial hardship during this pandemic to reach a fair outcome, ACCC Chair Rod Sim said. We need to maintain strong competition in the retail sector and supporting these businesses will help with economic recovery once the pandemic subsides. The authorization is voluntary and temporary and does not include individual tenants exchanging information about the amount of their rent or any rent incentives they were previously granted. And it's planned that the proposed cooperation will have regard to the proposed mandatory code of conduct, which sets out the good faith leasing principles applicable between landlord and small and medium shopping centre tenants. As with all of the temporary arrangements that industries are looking to implement as a means to deal with the virus issues they are facing, we will keep under consideration when they are no longer necessary, Mr Sims said. Having granted interim authorization for the arrangements, the ACCC will now seek feedback on the application for final authorization, which is sought for a period of 12 months from the date of authorization. And households stocking up during March, including, of course, toilet paper, enabled Australian retail turnover to rise 8.2% in March, seasonally adjusted, according to preliminary retail trade figures released today by the Australian Bureau of Statistics. This estimate is compiled from the monthly retail business survey and is based on preliminary data provided by businesses that make up about 80% of total retail turnover and therefore they will be subject to revision later. This is the strongest seasonally adjusted rise ever published in the retail trade publication, surpassing an increase of 8.1% in June 2000 when households bought forward expenditure ahead of the GST implementation. In seasonally adjusted terms, Australian turnover rose 9.8% in March 2020 compared with March 2019. The rise in seasonally adjusted terms in March was driven by the food retailing industry, with supermarkets and grocery stores, liquor retailing and other specialist food retailing all recording increases in demand. The food industry rose 23.5% or $2.7 billion in March, with the supermarket and grocery store subgroup rising 22.4% or $2.18 billion. Analysis of supermarket and grocery store scanning data shows that monthly retail turnover for perishable groceries and all other groceries increased by, in original terms, 21.6% and 35.6% respectively in March compared to February. Monthly turnover doubled for products such as toilet and tissue paper, flour, rice and pasta between February and March. While monthly turnover for canned food, medicinal products, and cleaning goods increased by more than 50%. The rise in supermarket retail turnover reached a peak in mid-March before levelling off at the end of the month. And strength was also seen in other non-food subgroups, for example, in the electrical hardware and other retailing subgroups, where businesses reported an increase in sales of items related to the setting up of home offices. Weakness was seen in cafes, restaurants and takeaway food services, clothing, footwear and personal accessory retailing and department stores. These industries recorded strong falls in turnover as a number of factors including regulations regarding social distancing measures limited the ability of businesses to trade as normal. But overall this update is clearly interesting 
but it does not provide much guide in assessing the economic impact of the virus on the wider economy. The impact of a bigger stockpiling boost in the first quarter, for example, is likely to be counterbalanced in GDP growth by a rundown in inventories and an influx of imports, all of which will likely see bigger corresponding pullbacks in the second quarter. As such, the main message is that March marks the beginning of what will clearly be some wild swings in the domestic economy ahead. And UBS says that the RBA may signal a taper in their bond purchases, but they see more bond buying ahead to avoid upward pressure on yields. The RBA's April meeting flagged a tapering of quantitative easing bond buying, and Philip Lowe went even further. He highlighted liquidity in the Australian government bond market has also improved substantially and as conditions in the market have improved and the three-year yield has settled around 25 basis points, we have scaled back our daily bond purchases to around $750 million. On the dovish side, Lowe reiterated, we will scale up these purchases again if needed and we will buy bonds in whatever quantity is required to achieve our goals. However, on the hawkish side, he noted, with conditions more settled at the moment, our plan for the immediate future is buying bonds only on Monday, Wednesday and Thursday, and not necessarily each day. But there's a problem with that. If the RBA buys only $0.5 billion each working day, as they did today, their total purchases will only rise by $47 billion. That will go to around $0.2 trillion by mid-2021 far less than the UBS projected $0.5 trillion in total government debt by next year to $1.5 trillion. Hence, UBS expect ongoing buying will be necessary to avoid unwanted upward pressure on long-term bond yields. And part of that, I suggest, depends on what happens with the virus and other central bank purchase programs. Certainly, the RBA looks as if it intends to control the yield curve some more. So much for free markets. And in fact, George Gammon and I discussed the limitations of central bank intervention in an extended show over on his channel, which was released today. I also discussed the Australian housing market in some detail, so check it out, but only after you finish this show. According to the South China Morning Post, a new study by one of China's top scientists has found the ability of the new virus to mutate has been vastly underestimated and different strains may account for different impacts of the disease in various parts of the world. Professor Li Langjuan and her colleagues from Zhejiang University found within a small pool of patients many mutations not previously reported. These mutations included changes so rare that scientists had never considered they might occur. And they also confirmed for the first time with laboratory evidence that certain mutations could create strains deadlier than others. The COVID virus has acquired mutations capable of substantially changing its pathogenicity, Lee and her collaborators wrote in a non-peer-reviewed paper just released. Lee's study provided the first hard evidence that mutation could affect how severely the virus causes disease or damages its hosts. The deadliest mutations in the Zhehang patients have also been found in most patients across Europe, while the milder strains were the predominant varieties found in parts of the United States, such as Washington State, according to their paper. And a separate study had found that New York strains had been imported from Europe. The death rate in New York was similar to that in many European countries, if not worse. But the weaker mutation did not mean a lower risk for everybody. According to the study in Zhang, two patients in their 30s and 50s who contracted the weaker strain became severely ill. Although both survived in the end, the elder patient needed treatment in an intensive care unit. This finding could shed light on differences in regional mortality. The pandemic's infection and death rates vary from one country to another, and many explanations have been proposed. Genetic scientists had noticed that the dominant strains in different geographic regions were inherently different. Some researchers suspected the varying mortality rates could in part be caused by mutations, but they had no direct proof. The issue was further complicated because survival rates depended on many factors such as age, 
underlying health conditions or even blood type. The sample size in this most recent study is remarkably small and it was an unexpected result from fewer than a dozen patients, indicating that the true diversity of the viral strains is still largely underappreciated, Lee wrote in this paper. Other studies tracking the virus's mutation usually involved hundreds or even thousands of strains. Lee's team detected more than 30 mutations, among them 19 mutations or about 60% were new. And they found some of these mutations could lead to functional changes in the virus's spike protein, a unique structure over the viral envelope, enabling the virus to bind with human cells. Computer simulation predicted that these mutations would increase its infectivity. Our understanding of the virus remains quite shallow, so questions such as where the virus came from, why it could kill so many young, healthy people, while generating no detectable symptoms in many others, still left scientists scratching their head. If there is a discovery that overturns the prevailing perception, don't be surprised. So again, to underscore, we are still early on the learning curve of this pesky virus. In the US, MBA's latest forbearance and call volume survey covers the period from April the 6th through to April the 12th, 2020, and represents almost 77% of the first mortgage servicing market, or 38.3 million loans. They reported that the total number of loans now in forbearance jumped from 3.74% of services portfolio volumes in the prior week to 5.95% as at April the 12th. Mortgages backed by Ginny May showed the largest growth at 2.37% from the prior week, and the largest overall share in forbearance by investor type at 8.26%. Depository services at 6.57% surpassed independent mortgage bank IMB services at 5.69% for the highest share of loans in forbearance. With over 22 million Americans filing for unemployment over the past month, homeowners are contacting their mortgage services seeking relief, leading to a sharp increase in the share of loans in forbearance across all loan types said Mike Franatoni, MBA's Senior Vice President and Chief Economist. Mortgage services continue to receive a very high level of forbearance requests, but volumes were down somewhat compared to the prior week. Given that lockdowns and associated job losses will continue in the coming weeks, forbearance inquiries will likely rise again as we approach May payment due dates. And the Bank of America says that gold prices have performed well in the recent period as the ultimate store of value. Gold prices have performed well during the past 50 months, posting a rally of over 10% since the Federal Reserve did a monetary policy U-turn in January 2019. Gold has also delivered a strong performance against other asset classes year to date. Of course, it has not been a straight line. And gold did sell off hard for a brief period in March. The swinging gold prices mirrored the down and then up move in real interest rates. Physical demand in traditional gold markets like jewellery looks soft and could be a drag on precious metal prices, they say. However, central banks across major emerging markets have been avid buyers of gold for their reserve portfolio. And as central banks in developed markets have expanded their balance sheets to support domestic assets and consumer prices, some central banks have become more proactive buyers of precious metals. In particular, Russia, China and India have opted to increase gold holdings in the past five years to diversify away from G10 sovereign bond positions. Investment demand has correlated strongly with gold prices in recent years, and they say that they expect precisely this group of buyers to drive gold prices higher. In other words, different levels of non-commercial demand are required to sustain different average price levels. Indeed, for gold to average $2,000 an ounce next year, purchases need to rise by 73% year over year. Given the current macroeconomic backdrop, they say we believe this figure is likely to be exceeded. We have long been gold bulls, they said, maintaining our constructive forecasts even through the recent volatility. That said, Gold has now hit our average fourth quarter 20 price forecast of $1,700 an ounce. Hence, they say, we are marking to market expectations while at the same time anticipating further upside, largely because central banks underwrite fiscal stimulus and financial markets through money printing, with fundamentals justifying a rally to 
$2,250 an ounce in 2021. Still, strong US dollar backdrop, reduced market volatility and lower jewellery demand will likely remain headwinds to gold. Beyond the supply-demand fundamentals, they say financial repression is back at an extraordinary scale. Rates in the US and most G20 economies will likely end up at or below zero for a very long time, just as central banks attempt to push inflation back above their targets. Beyond flow variables such as real rates, the US dollar or market risk, variables such as nominal GDP, central bank balance sheets or official gold reserves will remain key determinants of gold prices. If central banks double their balance sheets as GDP contracts, gold prices, they say, will push higher. Thus, they have increased the 18-month gold target from $2,000 to $3,000 an ounce. And the question then becomes, well, when will gold start to catch steam? They said, our work shows that Google Trends could be an early real-time indicator that broader interest is picking up. And Bloomberg says that historic changes are afoot in the energy market. It was no longer possible to deny that. In the words of Edward Morse, the veteran oil industry analyst who now heads commodity research at Citigroup, the future could be a benign low-cost price arena or a higher-cost politically charged one. Whatever comes true, the growth of the US position in the wake of the shale revolution has left it at the centre of what he calls the management of how the energy order will evolve. The glut of supply shows that it isn't yet ready for that role, just as Saudi Arabia and Russia are working out their own changed parts. But a new order will emerge. What is important is to avoid seduction by an exciting narrative or to over-extrapolate from the present into the future. Oil, with all its attendant geopolitical drama, is particularly susceptible to grand theories that go further than they should. Morse makes this fascinating point about beliefs back in 1999, the last time when oil was anything like as cheap as it is now. Oftentimes a prediction of the future that seems almost axiomatic could instead could be radically upended. In this case, a future of abundant oil supply and low prices. Thus, it is worth highlighting the March 4th, 1999 issue of The Economist magazine focusing on $10 oil forever, except that oil might fall to $5. At that time, four OPEC countries, Iran, Iraq, Nigeria and Venezuela, were sitting on huge low-cost oil reserves and were planning to add another million barrels per day of oil production for the next decade, if not longer. But five and ten years later, their group production was lower than it was back in 1998. And that Economist cover has indeed gone down into history, as has a follow-up produced in October 2003 in the wake of the invasion of Iraq. What instead happened was the greatest oil spike in history, with low prices failing to encourage extra production. The oil industry was taken completely by surprise by the rise of China and of other emerging markets, and the huge demand for oil that came in its wake. Add in financial speculation and oil prices would reach an all-time high by the summer of 2008. Again, the price gave rise to an explanation or a narrative, not the other way around. And by 2008, many took it as axiomatic that the world had reached peak oil and that production would begin to a slow decrease while prices ground ever higher. This view was everywhere that year and had great charts to back it up. In October 2008, this graphic accompanied an alarming piece in The Guardian, which detailed a task force which had been appointed to help prepare the UK for the coming peak and then decline in oil production. Such diagrams portray a sense of inevitability. Note that this was a best case scenario. Another perfect example of the genre came in Seeking Alpha, complete with a battery of charts, making clear that oil supply had nowhere to go but down. Here is one of the neatest. Bloomberg said, I think it's fair to say that none of the peak oil scenarios were consistent with prices going negative in the spring of 2020 owing to a glut of supply. 
this isn't to say that we will emerge from this predicament unscathed. The bursting of the oil bubble in 2008 hastened the dislocation of markets that was about to plunge the world into crisis. The long-term fall in prices that followed came mainly because the spike had spurred the growth of the shale industry. But it would also be wise not to assume that we are doomed to float on an oil lake for eternity and instead try to work out what the next narrative is going to be. And finally, the Australian government is boosting the nation's long-term fuel security by taking advantage of these dramatic falls in global oil prices and building on their agreement with the United States to access their strategic petroleum reserves, the SPR. Under the new measures, Australia will establish its first government-owned oil reserves for domestic fuel security. This will include a deal with the United States to store Australian government-owned crude oil in the US SPR. The Minister for Education and Emissions Reduction, Angus Taylor, said the government would also work with the private sector to consider options for improving domestic fuel security and will work with refineries on temporary measures to ensure to ease the stockpiles of jet fuel by amending fuel standards under the Fuel Quality Standards Act. The government is taking action to improve Australia's fuel security and to enhance our ability to withstand global shocks such as the virus. When they reach our shores, Minister Taylor said, Australians can be reassured that there is plenty of fuel in the country and we are extremely well placed to keep supplies flowing through the pandemic. The new measures will take advantage of the current low prices for oil and Australia's privileged position of access to the SPR, which is amongst the world's most cost-effective long-term oil storage facilities. This work is a down payment on a stronger and more secure fuel supply for Australian households, motorists, industry and the national economy. Today's announcement delivers immediate and medium-term measures that form a framework for a highly successful and domestically centred approach to fuel security, which will underpin our economic prosperity for the next decade and beyond. And global oil prices have hit new lows due mainly to a significant drop in demand caused by the virus and a lack of cost-effective long-term storage options. Australia has been negotiating access to the SPR since 2018, with Minister Taylor and US Energy Secretary Dan Brulletti signing the first arrangement of its type to facilitate this deal in March of this year. Australia will spend $94 million to buy oil at the current low global prices, and Australia has access to hold oil in the USSPR for an initial period of 10 years. And Minister Taylor said the government would shortly launch a process to work with the private sector to identify the best option for further strengthening fuel security in Australia. Terms of reference to guide this process will be released in due course and will focus on investment options supporting the refining sector and assessing the most effective stimulatory options. To help refineries, the government will work on a temporary change in fuel standards to provide refiners with more flexibility to adapt their operations to manage the changes in demand and oil prices as a result of the virus. Any change will be closely managed to ensure refiners have increased flexibility while motorists and the environment are protected. The temporary change provides Australian refineries with flexibility and can assist them to shore up their viability by helping them resolve some storage and supply issues, Mr Taylor said. At the end of February, Australia had 81 days worth of oil supplies, including 25 days of stocks in overseas points and in transit to Australia. The oil held and the SPR will count towards Australia's IEA 90-day stockpiling commitment. Now, it's interesting that I, in my live stream yesterday, suggested that Australia should indeed buy oil at these low prices. And it's also worth underscoring again that currently we are at severe risk because we only have a few days supply in Australia and the rest of it is in transit and overseas. So it does put Australia in a rather risky position. So I guess it's good that they're beginning to think more strategically. So my conclusion for today is that this is becoming an ever more convoluted pattern of issues that people need to manage. But remember that the underlying issue is that the virus is still there. It's still raging to an extent. And whilst the number of new infections may be lower than previously, 
we still haven't really solved the underlying issue. And until we have, everything else is still, well, mostly words, frankly. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching, and I'll see you again next time.